Good, we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to all of you here. Uh, welcome to another edition of Blockchain E Weekend by Inbox Events, uh, where we meet, learn, network, and grow together. Uh, this is the fourth Blockchain E Weekend in this series, and uh, we are very happy to have you here with us. Uh, just to let you know, uh, you guys know that you know we have thought about a new theme for every weekend. You know, with the hope of doing some incremental education, incremental awareness on various topics on cryptocurrency and blockchain. And uh, today's theme is uh, bringing real world assets on blockchain. All right. So while we've already been, uh, you know, we've already seen tokenization happening all across the world in a, in a wide variety of projects across the world, uh, we have not really ventured fully into tokenizing everything. All right. And uh, even if it is possible in, in parts, whatever it is. So so precious metals like gold, silver, platinum, company stocks, art, real estate. Heck, I've even heard people saying that we can tokenize resources. All right. So today we have uh, brought in two fantastic people who have ventured into this domain and are working towards uh, making this concept a reality. Please welcome uh, Tarusha Mittal. Tarusha, uh, she is the COO and uh, uh, co-founder of Oro Pocket, and uh, they are basically a very unique uh, investment platform on blockchain and she's also an award-winning entrepreneur been in tech for nearly a decade welcome Tarusha to uh, blockchain e weekend yes. thank you it's my pleasure and of course uh, this is uh, Tushar Tushar uh, is co-founder and CEO at persistence and uh, he's also leading the charge of uh, cosmos in India and of course you know when he started off He's been in Singapore, he's been working in a couple of uh, different ventures, including a very focused crypto VC fund called Lunex Ventures. Welcome, Tushar, to this thing. Uh, you know, we... We are in a very... Can you I just want to know whether everyone can hear me properly. Yeah, I think you dropped off for a second there, but now you're right. back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah. yeah, so so yeah, the internet all around yeah. the world is very sketchy because everybody is at home and working out of home so um, here we are and uh, the first session that we will probably have is from Tarusha. Uh, Tarusha is going to be talking about uh, a lot of things that she's been doing and how uh, blockchain as such can be used for real estates uh, for real assets on on on, on this entire platform. Uh, Tarusha over to you ma'am please uh, take forward I will hide myself. Sure so yeah okay i'll give a quick introduction and then i will just share my screen so uh, hi everybody i'm tarusha i'm the co-founder and ceo of oro pocket uh, oro pocket is uh, not just an investment platform uh, we are empowering users to invest in uh, gold and silver and thereafter use them as a real money in real time what this essentially means is that we are 100 percent asset backed banking on blockchain uh, so this is just a very quick intro of what we do uh, and now i'll just share my screen and hide myself so can you guys see me? Okay, yeah, I think you should be able to see the screen now. Can somebody tell me if they can see the screen? Because, yeah, okay, I think you can. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk about tokenizing real world assets. Uh, so nitty gritties of asset tokenizations in the real world and why is it even uh, required? So I'll start from the top. I'll start from the very basics. What is blockchain? What is tokenization? I think everybody here, because it's such a niche uh, and you're here attending this, uh, would know what blockchain is. But uh, nevertheless, uh, blockchain is basically nothing else but a public ledger. Uh, the technology implementation refers to the uh, you know act of recording anything that has value on that public ledger. Okay, So there are two ways. Uh, either the entire network needs to give consensus for the veracity of the transaction or put some money in. This is basically uh, proof of work and proof of stake. Uh, obviously, in proof of stake, there is a risk ante, which kind of uh, makes sure that the miners are not tampering or devaluing with the system in any way. Uh, so this is obviously a very quick proof of work, proof of stake sort of a definition. But moving on, the act of recording something on blockchain creates tokens. The very act creates tokens. Think of it uh, like digital assets represents the real asset or a part of that asset. So that you hear the word fractionalizing a lot. Uh, Tarusha, uh, uh, can you can you just uh, do the full screen on your uh, PPT so that we can see it? And, and for those who have, those and for those who want to see a full screen on the yeah. screen share by Tarusha, you will see a cross mark which you can expand the screen to full size. 
I'm Thank actually, you. Yeah, okay. Just allow me one minute. Okay, I'm sorry guys. I'm somehow not able to do it here. I can either open it in Chrome if you want. Or I can just zoom it in. Maybe that way. Is it better? Because I'm not able to remove this. For some reason, Acrobat is acting up. Shantanu, is this okay? Please let me know if I can continue. Yes, Arusha, please continue. So it's not, F5 is not working, I think. Uh, anyway, okay, so I, I'm really sorry. Okay, see, yeah. uh, so I'll just leave blockchain out of the mix. Uh, for now, what I can do is just, uh, you know, perhaps I can share my slides later, Shantanu, and then you can share it with everybody or you can put it up somewhere. Uh, that way, and primarily, whatever the whatever is on the slides, I'm going to be talking about it. So you're not going to miss out on anything if you're not able to read it or it's not legible. Uh, anyway, so yeah, leaving blockchain out of the picture. So tokenization is actually nothing new. It's basically securitization, but done on blockchain. Uh, all of us have heard of securitization in some way or the other. I think most of us would have seen uh, Big Short. Uh, so no, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead with your entire uh, presentation, ma'am. Okay. Cool. Uh, so the concept of securitization is basically a more general form of tokenization. It goes way back before the emergence of cryptocurrencies. Securitization is the process of pooling various types of contractual debt obligations and uh, then, you know, perhaps selling them as bonds or pass through securities or CDOs. As I said, all of us must have seen Rick Short and it talks about CDOs quite a lot. So securitization has been in place for a while, uh, turning assets into securities or turning debt into, uh, you know, uh, securities altogether and selling them off. Tokenization is basically like securitization, except that you're putting this on blockchain. So I'll, I'll give you another example. Uh, if you have, say, a real estate property worth $100,000 and uh, you need, like, quickly you need to raise $20,000 and you don't want to sell the whole um, you know, property, that is where tokenization makes it easier. So, you know, you tokenize an asset, you can divide its value and ownership rights, you can fractionalize it. So your property, which is worth 100,000 can be perhaps divided into 100,000 tokens, wherein each token represent, uh, you know, a certain share of the property. So when user buys a certain token, they own that particular percentage share of the property. So if they buy 30,000 tokens in this particular example, then they will own 30% of the property value. And if they buy all 100,000, then they become 100% owners of the property. Uh, this is how tokenization works. And with the very nature of this particular technology blockchain, uh, it's immutable. So once registered, the ownership of the asset cannot be altered or erased. <clears throat> So the gist is uh, the tokenization of assets is a concept uh, using blockchain to securitize assets. It's the process of issuing a blockchain token uh, that digitally represents a real tradable asset. These can either represent regulated financial instruments, uh, you know, equities, bonds, loans, funds, tangible assets uh, like real estate, artwork, precious metals, or even, uh, you know, intangible assets like intellectual property, copyright to works, authorship, etc. Now, why do we need blockchain at all? So, you know, it's not just a fancy word to add to the mix because everybody seems to be using blockchain now. But why do we need blockchain for real assets? So there is no real, uh, you know, no territorial barrier when it comes to blockchain. When you put assets on blockchain, any investor can invest in a property located in any part of the world without visiting there physically. Investment becomes secure. They become fast. They become easy with asset tokenization so uh, then again you eliminate the middleman so there is no uh, you know escrow involved there is no uh, you know another party like a third party involved and again it makes things move much faster there is fractional ownership so basically assets that might have been out of your reach earlier because you know there might have been a minimum investment amount or they are just uh, really expensive to get into they kind of become more available Right. When they are highly, you know, when they are digitized, they become they become highly divisible. So investors can actually invest in small percentages. For example, as I gave you with that particular real estate, uh, you know, a farm, you can if you tokenize it, then you can actually own a part of that farm. OK, there is a, you know, a broader investor base. Obviously, again, this comes to the territorial barrier aspect, because in trading in real world assets, it has a restriction of demography. 
uh, where you are located. But with asset tokenization, that gets eliminated completely. It's completely uh, possible to sell or buy tokens that represent a fraction of ownership of something that mm. is not, uh, you know, uh, a close buy to you. So that and uh, cheaper and quicker, obviously, because uh, uh, then once it is on blockchain, once it is tokenized, it is far more cheaper to do these transactions. The fee is almost negligible, uh, depending on the chain that you're using. They can be really, really quick. Again, they are quicker and faster when you, you know, as against doing it uh, in real time without tokenizing it. And obviously, then you know, depending on the chain, how cheap or how quick that would come into play. Uh, improved liquidity, obviously, bringing the investment process on blockchain uh, provides a low friction environment, right? So asset tokenization, it enables automated transfer of ownership while ensuring compliance. So with reduced complexity, cost, tokenized assets present the possibility to invest with fiat money or using, uh, you know, P2P trading on a regulated exchange, thus improving liquidity. Uh, so why do we need to do this at all? What is the need to tokenize assets? So here again, uh, the reasons would be pretty much a lot similar to why uh, is blockchain required. So it, you know, tokenizing assets make them accessible because of fractional ownership. Uh, they become accessible. These are, they can be accessed anywhere around the world 24 uh, seven. They become immutable. Uh, so anyone, once they buy a token, ownership cannot be revoked in any way. You, you know, there can be no uh, fraud when it comes to ownership. Uh, it can be transferred, obviously, from one person to another. Uh, but, you know, disputes uh, and conflicts can be solved up quickly because you can just look up those immutable records which are there on blockchain. It's completely transparent. As each record is maintained on blockchain, it's completely transparent for everybody to see what is happening. It's cost effective. Again, uh, it's very cost effective as when you compare it to, uh, you know, real time trading of assets where the fees can be really high. Uh, so eliminating intermediary, intermediaries can also you know helps with this because there are no middlemen so that also kind of brings down the cost and it's easy to invest so tokenized assets offer greater liquidity they offer uh, the possibility you know of fractional ownership and uh, removes that you know that minimum investment amount as i spoke of earlier so scope of tokenization what all can we tokenize after all so as uh Shandu, you know mentioned in the beginning uh, we can, we, you know, people are trying to tokenize uh, a lot of things from exotic assets like artworks, sport teams, race horses. He mentioned. I also mentioned it in my uh, slides. Tradition and even traditional assets like bonds, real estate, venture capital funds, commodities, precious metals. Almost every asset class can be tokenized as long as there is some value, some transfer happening. You can put it on blockchain. So real estate is being uh, tokenized. Commodities, as I mentioned, private equity shares, physical goods. The list is huge. So the benefits of tokenization because it increases liquidity, creates faster settlements, lower costs, and you know bolsters up the risk management. Tokenization is the way to go. So how do you start doing it? Like as a, a person, you know, you're looking at some sort of an asset class and you think you're an expert in it. How do you go about doing it? So simple steps are just for you take an asset, you fractionalize it, you put it on a uh, blockchain and there you go. You, you know, tokenize an asset. But uh, the, <laughs> you know, the jokes aside, the detailed process uh, would be basically uh, to identify the asset you want to tokenize obviously then you evaluate the asset value and the confirmation you determine the to tokenomics okay the economics of your tokens uh, what do they represent you start generating smart contracts obviously before this you have to choose which chain you're putting this on uh, decide how you want to tokenize whether you're giving equity or cash flow and do you know whatever kind of compliance that is required in your country so with chain uh, again this is uh, you know I can talk about this ad nauseum, I think, but I won't go into a lot of details. But main questions to ask yourself before choosing a chain would be, uh, how scalable is it? Okay, for, for by that I mean how many transactions can it handle per second? Okay, so Bitcoin can you know uh, handle a certain number of transactions, and Ethereum can handle some, and it's different with Stellar as well. So you have to figure out how quickly do you need. Um, your particular chain to you know respond to your transactions scalability is the first question that you should be asking what is the cost involved is uh, another question that you should be asking what is the gas cost involved what is the cost per transaction because ultimately somebody will have to bear that cost 
uh, adoption adoption is very important because with all blockchain platforms that are based on you know they are all based on the same kind of overarching uh, philosophy that they can uh, but they differ in the functionality aspect right for example ethereum and ripple just like taking two examples so are both on blockchain technology but they offer vastly different functions so ethereum is more of smart contracts defi uh, it or enforcing agreements between two parties ripple on the other hand has stomped itself as more of currency transfer technology that makes uh, cross border transactions easier so it is important to look at the adoption rate and the community support as well because that will help you in the long run if you're trying to tokenize something uh, are there you know do those tokens being utilized at all so that also like kind of tells you whether uh, what kind of a community support can you expect uh, functionality so i think functionality i have already covered uh, because you know i gave examples of how some chains might be more suitable to do certain jobs or to record certain kind of uh, information than the others uh, you know which chain really now because you know we have done this we have actually tokenized gold and silver ownership uh, so we have chosen uh, ethereum and we chose matic for as a side chain and the reasons why we chose uh, ethereum and uh, matic primarily it was a uh, speed cost community support and matic is also you know special love for uh, an in, in, in indian project uh, i haven't mentioned this here but yeah that that was that also you know kind of uh, had a role to play in the choice that we made so speed and scalability obviously we wanted uh, it uh, matic is is fast we wanted the transactions to be processed nearly instantly uh, the cost is almost negligible Uh, the community support is uh, amazing with matic and the support that the you know their tech team can, has given us uh, on all fronts like uh, technical marketing operations everything was uh, really amazing and that is another reason why we chose uh, matic so my experience so at oro pocket as i have uh, already mentioned i'll touch upon this very briefly the vision is to create a you know inclusive platform where we tokenizing multiple asset classes currently we are just tokenizing gold and silver Uh, so every one gram of gold or silver is equal to one token. Uh, so how does this help the end user? It's a fractional asset. You can invest with as little as one cent, one rupee in India. Uh, it opens up secondary market trading. So opens up an entire world of possibilities to trade against gold and silver, age-old acceptable forms of valuation and store of value. Uh, almost instant and cheap transactions um, open up with Oro Pocket. So you can. instantly actually transfer your assets of cross border transactions you can pay and get paid almost instantly as well in an asset class rather than in fiat because fiat loses value year after year just staying in your bank so the kind of future uh, that holds for fractionalizing in general and for oro pocket so at oro pocket we are looking at other precious metals as well so we are looking uh, exploring platinum and palladium we are also looking at art uh, startups wines plantations and as i said more precious metals and collectibles uh, there is a typo collectibles is not spelled like that uh, but yeah so the uh, we are going to be adding multiple asset classes on oro pocket and for a future of uh, tokenizing in general of real world assets i think the world's your oyster as long as any asset class you know uh that you think is kind of currently out of the reach even if it is not out of the reach like that is the reason why we are doing it if you think an asset class is out of the reach of users and it can be fractionalized in one way or another and you know you can record the transactions on blockchain then uh, i think it's a good fit to uh, be tokenized so yeah i think i'm pretty much done uh, in case you want to get in touch with me i'm very active on twitter and uh, there's my email as well i'll share these slides uh after this particular call so that you know you guys can look in i'll be happy to take any questions and shantanu it would be nice if you show up now i think i made it in good time right yeah yeah you did i mean you probably made it much before time actually <laughs> cool. so thank you thank you tarusha i think it was uh, uh, you can you know unshare your screen now so that we can um, all come on board thank you tarusha for being there so uh, guys are there any questions for tarusha at this point in time or shall we take it later on please let us know um so right now there is no question i guess okay there is one question which has come up here so tarusha uh, deep moni das uh, he is asking you know will so if you check the uh, questions tab it it says you know hmm. will the asset be in sto i can't so there is a question tab on the Peter? hello where is the asset in sto that's what you said Asset be, oh, no, be an asset. Maybe it's 
will you have so uh, you know it depends on what sort of an asset it is uh, you know if it is like a uh, you know asset like a, a fund or, or a vc fund or some sort of shares that you know you are tokenizing perhaps or if you are doing startups uh, then you know sto perhaps can be a way to go so now there is a new thing you know also there that initial token uh, a tokenization asset of offering that you know people do have gotten and received uh, white papers regarding that as well i think it depends on the asset uh, you know you uh, you it will uh, depend what way for you to go if you want to do an sto and uh, that's not the only way to do it because ultimately you are just adding to your um, liquidity like if you have a real world asset then what you're doing is you are just like using you know you are you are, you are uh, using those funds unlike with uh, icos which was uh, which was like a whole different ball game uh, stos i think a they need some compliance so compliance is uh, you know uh, different in every country for stos when you do securitization it's different so that legal play comes into the picture which was not the case with icos until much later obviously and then there was that bust uh, with icos as i said it's more like you know you are doing an ipo when you are raising money uh and with stos or with any kind of a tokenized offering when there is a real asset uh you know backing that particular token then it ultimately that is all just going for uh you know that it, that money is going for that asset liquidity so that is what you are doing so those are the main i think differences it will depend a lot on what kind of an asset are you trying to tokenize um and then you know you can decide what route to take did i get the question right because your voice was breaking i just assumed that this is it No, no, yeah, of course. So, no, uh, so I think I okay. probably wanted to know, you know, whether the whether this will be a security token offering or how are you doing the conversion okay. of gold? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, uh, so we are recording uh, these. Uh, you know, these are these are ERC twenty tokens. Uh, we are using Matic as a side chain. We'll be moving it uh, now because now they've recently launched their mainnet. uh but uh, we are not planning to do any uh, you know uh, like an sto so you can directly go on the uh, platform if you are uh, you know if you've been invited it's an invite only platform what i can also do is perhaps i can put an invite in the chat box so people who are attending this can uh, sign up and they'll get a signing a sign up bonus as well of gold or silver and uh, yeah so uh, we you know you right now currently you can just go on the website and you will buy whatever uh, gold or silver you are buying uh, you know the same amount of tokens if because 1 gram of uh, gold or silver is one token so the same kind of tokens would be added to your wallet okay cool so this the there's a question we'll take that question because it's pretty interesting because mm -hmm. uh, ashish uh, akash verma is asking that you know it's great that you know you tokenize gold and silver and you're probably moving it to a side chain like matic and all but matic and ethereum being a, a public chain all right hmm. and the information is available to public you know would it be easy for anyone to access and leak information of someone's private assets so what is uh, your so, take on uh, that so no so these are all pseudonymous uh, like you know the records are pseudonymous and it is uh, not that you know you can actually access uh, somebody else's uh, uh, financial information like that that is uh, what this person is referring to because these are i understand that these are public things but all of these transactions are recorded pseudonymously cool so so great so yeah so uh, what we'll do is i think you know we will keep some questions for the end wherein we'll have yeah. both you and tushar coming in and uh, we have the last 10 minutes and this is for the audience as well so you know you can uh, put your questions here you can also come live if you want to and we'll use the last 10 minutes to ensure that we'll do a small uh, small discussion between tushar and tarusha on this topic right thank you so uh, yeah absolutely yeah yeah thank you tarusha uh, thank you guys uh, good questions i think let them keep on coming and uh, the next session of course is you know tushar is here tushar is uh, he's been very deeply involved in a lot of different kind of uh, assets and uh, you know i had a word with tushar and he he mentioned this fact that the we can go beyond the current uh, understanding of our assets so tushar uh, the stage is yours uh, please take it forward and uh, you know let's let the people know what your thoughts are on this topic thank you shantanu and thank you again for uh, uh, for hosting this event and and organizing it on such uh, you know uh, regular cadence um so quick question in terms of i mean a uh, quick point before uh, talking about you know why i mean why did i get into tokenizing you know quote unquote um real world assets so uh, one of the things that shantanu mentioned um in the introduction is 
Um, so prior to starting Persistence, which is the company that I run at the moment, um, what I did uh, prior to this was help to set up a crypto VC fund in Singapore, which was the crypto arm of a traditional venture capital fund um, called Golden Gate. Now, um, while setting this, uh, you know, fund up, there were a few things. So one was, um, you know, it was very exciting to, you know, invest kind of in, both in a personal capacity as well as, you know, through the fund in multiple kind of layer one solutions, scalability solutions, privacy solutions. And then at the application level, you know, gaming, gambling, DeFi. Um, but I mean, if we look at, you know, uh, I think, you know, DeFi probably has um, a decent, you know, what we call a product market fit uh, within the startup world. Um, but again, I think if we if we take a step back and, you know, I don't know how many of you have actually been, you know, farming any yield on some of the DeFi projects, you know, like Compound, Balancer. Um, recently, I would actually really want to know as well. Uh, you know, maybe you can um, put it down in the chat if you have been playing around with any of the, um, uh, you know, DeFi products. Um, but essentially, you know, even DeFi today has, you know, some of the most popular products have about, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 daily active users. So it's it's literally, we're literally at a time when, um, you know, a company like Amazon would have its first 1,000 power customers or um, when Facebook was still, um, you know, where you still needed a harvard.edu address uh, to... Uh, to be able to access, uh, you know, Facebook, it hadn't become, you know, public, uh, so to say, or open to the public uh, to start using the platform. Uh, so, you know, the first thing, first kind of thesis that um, I have or had um, is um, that, you know, it's, it's still uh, extremely, extremely um, early days, but DeFi seems to have somewhat of a product market fit as far as you know blockchain is concerned um and then obviously you know why does it have you know what's the appeal of DeFi? i think some of the stuff um you know tarusha has already covered in terms of um you know things being borderless so you know it doesn't matter what country um the, you know you're from you can get access which is the second point you can get access to these products in a relatively permissionless manner you don't have to take anyone's permission to be able to um you know get exposure to these assets so for example um actually i would really like to know if if any of you have been playing around with um with any of the DeFi products and the second thing is i want to know if anyone has um in the past um done anything with non-fungible tokens so crypto kitties if anyone remembers uh from 2017 uh, which massively um, uh, jammed the Ethereum blockchain. Crypto tanks, okay. Anyone else? Anyone has been playing around with any DeFi products here? Kitties, yes, okay. Um, right. So, um, what my hypothesis was that, you know, today we have about, if you go to defipulse.com, um okay yeah so we see defi pulse coming up in the chat as well um uh so if we go to defi pulse.com which essentially tracks all the um you know decentralized finance projects uh then we'll see that there's about 1.6 billion dollars worth of um crypto assets that have been locked into smart contracts on the ethereum chain um now that number seems you know decently large but if we put it in context of, you know, the amount of assets that banks hold, um, it is, you know, probably, a, you know, it's probably less than 0.01% uh, of the total assets that exist in the world or the total assets that banks have um, in the world. Um, so what we wanted to do at Persistence was um, we wanted to see, and, you know, today, if you play around with more DeFi products, you know, so say I'm sitting on some Ethereum, uh, what can I do with the Ethereum, right? Um, what do you do with the money? Like, so you get a, you get your salary. What do you want to do with the salary? You want to buy things. You want to speculate with the money. Maybe, you know, buy some mutual funds or some stocks. 
um, you want to, um, uh, you know, you want to invest, you want to earn some interest, you want to speculate and you want to spend. Those are the few things that you want to do with your money. Today I have, you know, I'm sitting on Ethereum. It's just sitting in my wallet and I can't really do much. But with the evolution of DeFi today, I can lend out my Ethereum on about seven, eight percent interest. You know, there's a company in India called Bank of Hodlers um, that is working on this where you can deposit your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, um, your USDT or other stable coins and earn interest um, uh, on it. So essentially it starts, you know, becoming like a bank. Uh, um, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to see, you know, how can we expand the scope today? Um, you know, I have ETH. I can either give it to Bank of Hodlers earn some interest. I can go to something like a maker DAO, deposit my ETH, uh, open up a CDP. If you guys are interested and start reading about what maker does, open up a CDP and mint some, borrow some stable coins. So for every, you know, hypothetically hundred dollars of Ethereum that I deposit, I can borrow, say, you know, uh, think about $80 uh, worth of stable coin. Now I have $80 in my wallet. What can I do with this? What do I typically do with this $80? I typically use it to buy more Ethereum because on a long term scale, I'm bullish on Ethereum, for example. And so um, essentially it becomes a leveraged trade of sorts. Um, you know, tomorrow Ethereum, uh, that $80 becomes 160. Hypothetically, I will, I will sell off my Ethereum, pay back the $80 loan that I've taken uh, and, you know, essentially keep the uh, $80 um, profit. But what we wanted to do at Persistence was expand the scope beyond um, using NFTs on one hand, just for collectibles and things like, um, uh, you know, uh, things like CryptoKitties. Um, and on the other hand, um, use the features of open finance, of decentralized finance to um, solve some, you know, real world problems. And as a byproduct of solving these real world problems, you enable more cash flow into the industry. And at some level, that's what Oro Pocket is you know, doing as well, where I'm presuming um, that, um, you know, they would be targeting millennials, you know, like, so my parents would not, I am presuming, go on to something like Oro Pocket to buy digital gold because they will never trust a platform like that. But for the millennials, it would make a lot of sense where they don't want to buy gold and put it in a safety deposit box. Um, uh, what, uh, you know, what millennials want to do is, you know, just, you know, uh, do a couple of clicks, ensure that, you know, uh, uh, you know, there is enough, um, uh, like sort of third party verification to make sure that the gold or silver is actually there and, um, uh, and essentially, you know, uh, indirectly get exposure to, uh, to gold and silver and, and expand their, you know, portfolio. Um, so what we wanted to do is something similar, but we wanted to do it more at an institutional level. Um, and so, you know, target a lot of, uh, you know, family offices, family owned conglomerates, um, SME traders. Um, so, you know, traders that do, you know, trades that do annual trading volume of say between hundred million to $2 billion a year. Um, so essentially what we do is we tokenize real world assets, um, such as invoices. So I don't know how many of you have. Um, you know, read about or come across invoice financing as a tool. Uh, what is invoice financing? Uh, it's essentially a short term business loan um, uh, to a business owner. Uh, so essentially, you know, I am the seller of a product. Uh, there's a buyer. Um, I will typically sell to the buyer on credit terms. So I will get paid, you know, 30 to 90 days after I've actually, you know, made the sale. Um, now I have, you know, this account receivable. Uh, which is an asset in my books. Um, but I don't have, you know, I may have liquidity issues because, uh, you know, I, maybe I've sold something for 10 lakhs. You know, I need to pay other, um, I need to pay salaries to my employees. I need to pay other vendors that I may have. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, I need to uh, get liquidity from somewhere. So I have this asset sitting uh which is this account receivable. There are certain platforms today in India as well, globally as well, where I can sell my asset, which is my account receivable to um, other, um, you know, traders or, or trade financiers. And so say I'm supposed to receive 10 lakhs. Um, these guys will say, okay, um, instead of, you know, giving you 10 lakhs, we'll give you nine lakhs and you give us the asset at maturity. So, you know, 30 to 90 days from now, these guys will collect the entire 10 lakhs, netting that one lakh profit. 
and I get liquidity in the process. So essentially, these are the kinds of use cases that we are trying to facilitate at um, at persistence. Uh, and so, similar to what you know, um, you know, Tarusha mentioned, where you know, uh, you know, Oro Pocket is looking to kind of tokenize different kinds of assets. Um, uh, persistence does something similar, where we have different applications sitting on top of the uh, persistence chain. And each of these applications uh, focuses on different kinds of real world assets. So the different real world assets uh, could be invoices. It could be bills of lading. So bills of lading are, is essentially a document um, that uh, when you're an ex exporter, um, you once you load on the you know uh, goods onto the ship. Uh, so uh, you the uh, usually the you know sh uh, port authority or the you know the shipping company itself will issue you. A bill of lading giving you uh, ownership um, of the goods that you've just been loaded. Now, this bill of lading can be traded multiple times as well. Uh, so, essentially, we're focused on two kinds of high level, two kinds of assets. One is um, things like invoices, bills of lading, which are all kind of business documents. On the other hand, we're focused on certain new age um, uh, products like. Um, uh, you know, uh, solar credits, uh, social impact bonds, um, renewable energy credits, and then some, you know, crypto native products like staking derivatives and things like that. If, if some of you have been following um, the staking uh, ecosystem very closely. Uh, uh, what we do, and I think one kind of, you know, fundamental difference um, in the architecture or in terms of the approach between how Oro Pocket is approaching this and how we're approaching this is when you want to tokenize um, uh, business documents, essentially what we do is most business documents are actually already digital. Um, but some, you know, in certain, you know, traditional industries, uh, these business documents can actually still be paper documents. Uh, so depending on whether these paper doc, uh, whether these documents are, um, uh, you know, business document, uh, whether they're digital or paper based, um, we'll essentially convert them um into we'll document fingerprint and uh, essentially capture all the metadata of each of these documents um and use an nft to represent these um these uh business documents um why do we use nfts because each document is unique uh so unlike gold where you know every um you know every bar of gold or every coin of gold is essentially fungible as long as you know you know the carrots or the weight or you know some other properties are the same so you would be indifferent between getting you know 10 grams of you know one coin of you know a 10 gram um you know gold coin or um 10 coins of one gram uh, gold coins but essentially it's different when it comes to you know business documents uh, so essentially what we do is we use nfts where each document is not fungible uh, 100 tons of wheat originating from Canada is different from 100 tons of wheat um, or corn originating from, say, Australia. Um, and so that's why we um, and, you know, as some of you who are you know native to blockchain would know, an NFT like a collectible, like a crypto kitty where or like, say, a Pokemon represented by an NFT. Um, each Pokemon is unique with some unique characteristics. We've just used that concept in business documents where each business document is unique. Um, and so we represent these business documents using NFTs. Once these business documents are tokenized using these NFTs, uh, they can be easily traded. They can be easily used as collateral to borrow and lend against. Now, um, uh, like I said, you know, uh, our primary focus is, you know, mostly um, institutional traders, family offices. But as the crypto market cap is go growing, you know, we're, you know, increasingly focusing, we're, we're going to be increasingly focusing on the crypto native market as well. So in addition to working with kind of institutional traders, institutional financiers, uh, we'll be working with like, for example, the stable coin holders. So the large whales uh, who can, you know, do up to like 100K to 500K or even smaller, um, you know, lenders. So, you know, you're sitting on, say, uh, you know, $500 of uh, USDT, uh, you know, which you got on Wazirx or one of the, you know, crypto exchange uh, platforms. And you want to earn some yield. You go to bank of hodlers, you know, they'll give you about 11%. Um, and you come to, you know, our platform will give you somewhere between, you know, say 12 to 18% um, returns on your uh, stable coins, which can be, you know, pretty attractive. Um, 
the second point is you know if we look at the context of the world today so tarusha mentioned the um, you know uh, no territory aspect of it or the borderless aspect as we call it um uh today we live in a zero interest environment in most parts of the developed world or negative interest rates even um so i think there's about 13 trillion dollars um worth of capital that is sitting in negative yielding bonds uh today in europe in japan um and increasingly so in the us um whereas in india you can actually still you know generate you know decent yield um if you finance these invoices you can still generate decent yield you know 12 to 18% um and agreed there may be you know certain amount of you know counterparty risk credit risk involved with uh, you know financing such instruments but net net is it still you know if you compare the risk is it still better to you know earn negative interest rate or you know maybe earn uh, you know maybe not 12 to 18% overall but you know say maybe generate 10 to 12 percent um you know after you know uh, you know some of the defaults or things like that non payments um and things like that so essentially what we're trying to do is um facilitate more efficient flow of capital around the world in a borderless permissionless manner um for both retail as well as institutional clients um where we can have folks from um uh you know the developing world allocate capital to the developed world in a currency hedged manner um which is becomes a win 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 it's a win for us obviously it's a company it's a win for the developed world where people are able to generate yield on that um on, on the fiat money that they're holding on um uh, and find other avenues to invest and it's a win for um you know business owners who need short term business financing but may not be able to go to the bank uh to uh you know get financing uh so essentially you know this is how we're doing it um so it's it's sitting at the confluence of um tokenizing real world assets um leveraging features from decentralized finance open finance and then using uh non fungible tokens to tokenize uh these assets I want to you know I know there's about 17 minutes left I want to I know there's some questions coming up um so definitely want to spend some time uh, on the questions but essentially that is um one last point sorry I forgot to mention so essentially today uh, um you know what do we have actually in terms of a working product um I know Shantanu asked me not to talk too much about persistence so I'm you know refraining um from talking too much about the company but essentially today what we're doing is we have a commodity marketplace so trading of physical commodities um and it's commodity agnostic so commodities like metals uh, uh and when i say metals i mean more like copper aluminum i don't mean precious metals uh, uh livestock uh energy products so things like palm oil coal um and uh products like grains so soya wheat um things like that so these are the products that are being traded and trade financed um on comdex today uh, comdex is a, a singapore based uh, commodity trading platform um it is processed about 30 million dollars worth of trades today it has offices across you know singapore hong kong dubai kuala lumpur which are in asia kind of the highest um you know trading volume corridors uh and uh, currently as i mentioned more focus on institutional folks but you know we're coming out with our more retail focused uh, product as well Th- that's the end of my presentation thank you shantanu hey thanks thanks uh, tushar it was uh, pretty brilliant because you know when i first spoke to you about you know tokenization and bringing real world assets on blockchain i think the first thing that came to my mind only was you know talking about precious metals or art or you know and i i happened to read up something called uh, somebody wanted to do race horses on this thing so that was pretty interesting for me as well as to how can you you know how can we tokenize race you know but of course you know when we talk about things like non fungible tokens and all i think all these things come forward so thank you very much uh, uh, people for your uh, you know fantastic uh, presentation yeah tushar they, these things are very new to us uh, when it comes to you know, in actual looking at the invoicing or trade invoices which are there as such So uh, yeah that's the first time i really heard that yeah we can really tokenize them as well not the sudden the fact that i have actually put in money in an ico in a company called the hive uh, it's called the hive blockchain and they are actually doing that where they are tokenizing 
the uh, trade invoices and they have a platform called the Hive, Hive platform, which is doing pretty well. All right, good. So great, uh, good. So there are plenty of questions and some questions kept on popping up in my mind as well. And one of them is very, very clear out here is one thing which somebody is asking here is a lot of people asking is the regulatory affair around uh, tokenizing. Now, let's talk about India per se first and then we talk about global, you know. So where is regulation on this when it comes to tokenizing uh, a real asset on blockchain? I mean, where are we standing? What is the standpoint of regulation? Because are we really allowed to tokenize real assets? Yeah. Anyone, yeah. I mean, you uh, both of you have your own perspectives. Um, sure, sure. I'll, I'll go first. Um, so, um, see, the, the beautiful part about physical commodities. So we're not talking about derivatives here. We're not talking about options or futures on commodities. We're talking about physical goods, um, at least in Comdex's case, which is the first use case that we're supporting. Um, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, trading of physical goods is a very lightly regulated market. Um, and, uh, you know, even, you know, things like unless so again, um, you know, Comdex is not essentially an exchange. It, it is more of a marketplace. It is matching, um, you, you know, buyers and sellers on both sides. It's just that the, um, the, the good that the marketplace is facilitating matches and, uh, ma um, you know, ma matching of buyers and sellers is, uh, physical commodities. So, you know, fortunately it's, it's a, you know, a very lightly regulated market, uh, you know, the biggest, um, uh, compliance requirement is more around KYC AML. Uh, but, you know, one point is that, um, thus far, um, so commodity trading is a, is a $19 trillion market, uh, to begin with, but you would have never heard about commodity trading, um, in general, especially as a, you know, retail investor. And, and that's purposely done. Uh, it's highly lucrative, a lot of arbitrage opportunities. Um, but essentially, um, it is a game that has, you know, till today been only available to, um, you know, uh, larger trading organizations. Uh, so even the small, like I mentioned, I think earlier, even the small to medium sized trading organizations, uh, within the commodity trading space, you know, do about, you know, half a billion, like hundred million to about $2 billion worth of transaction volume a year. Um, and so it's not the barriers to entry are really high. Um, in terms of just entering uh, yeah. the space. And that's why people don't hear about it. Uh, but essentially, I mean, and that's that's the whole point of, you know, uh, democratizing access, you know, so similar to how the internet democratized access to information. Um, essentially what, you know, this industry kind of stands for is democratizing access to, um, you know, uh, primarily, you know, financial products, uh, you know, there are obviously other use cases, but, you know, finance is turning out to be one of the biggest use cases. Uh, and, and so essentially that's what, you know, we are trying to do as well, uh, obviously in a regulatory compliant manner, but, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, as far as commodity trading goes, loosely regulated, newer alternative assets like solar credits, there are no regulations around it yet. Um, yeah. newer alternative assets, um, like social impact bonds, you know, there are no, uh, regulations because again, everything is so new, even the, you know, uh, the government hasn't caught up to it yet, but of course, you know, there will be a point where, um, you know, there will be some sort of regulations. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, kind of that's where we stand at, but again, it, uh, one last point from, from, uh, my aspect. So, uh, persistence is more of the tech layer behind these user facing into applications. So Comdex is an application on top of persistence, similar to kind of how OroPocket is an application on top of, you know, Ethereum and Matic. So persistence is more of the technology layer. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not experts at any one thing. So we work with entrepreneurs who are experts or who have the network and expertise within commodity trading or people who have the expertise and network within, uh, you know, social impact bonds or, um, you know, trading of solar credits. And so we work with experts who run and entrepreneurs who run these applications, but we are more at the kind of, you know, technology layer. We work very closely with these applications and any of the integrations that they may need, um, any of the, you know, tweaking of the code that may be required, you know, okay. but, um, yeah.
so just so the compliance the burden of compliance actually goes on to the end application uh, layer and not the technology stack okay so the okay, burden so actually falls with people like tarusha yeah tarusha please yeah your Correct. perspective yeah so uh, yeah we are not just uh, you know a tech layer we are uh, actually like a financial ecosystem what we are trying to create uh, that you know we want to add more asset classes to our pocket and tokenize them fractionalize them uh, enable people to take better decisions for uh, their financial future uh, what tushar said very correctly it's very lightly uh, you know uh, regulated currently but i think regulations can be good because they protect the end user and uh, currently there might not be regulations for uh, you know a lot of newer kind of asset classes which uh, you know the layman is not even aware of uh, but they will come in due course of time uh, currently again i think you know tokenizing has been um, you know the securitization aspect as i said it depends on the kind of asset a uh, class that you're going uh, to invest in so you know securitization has been there and tokenization thereby has also been there so the only new thing that we that is happening currently is uh, the blockchain aspect and that in itself the technology the policy around it is uh, is in its infancy everywhere around, you know around the world not just in india so uh, what tushar said i think i'm uh, you know i i concur it's it's very lightly regulated uh, and a uh, tokenization in itself there you know if even if you think about it it's it's not uh, that uh, there can be many uh, difficult uh, you know compliance to be put in place because it's very straight forward so uh, as an industry standard we practice you know the kyc uh, aml policies uh, that are there uh, so, so as to make sure that the platform is secure and the end user is also safe you you're on mute chantanu yeah you always fail to see that red bot so uh, yeah so i think uh, uh, when we look at uh, regulations per se we, we've always been in the past but two years we have been we talking about regulations coming up but we are not very sure whether even if regulations come will it circumpass all the aspects of blockchain because it's you know it's a huge huge ocean and we can't be going regulating okay let's regulate tokenization let's regulate this it actually has to be a uh, a general layer of regular uh, you know regulatory aspects and then it goes above and all that yeah so good i think yes we'll have to wait and see uh, how people react to it i think right now it is more limited to us as well us only uh, people who are proponents of blockchain or the crypto or tokenization it has to be seen how the the authorities react to it when it comes to that uh, so this so yeah of course you know there's one more interesting question which is coming from aul b all right um, so he says you know till now you know we have been uh, working on ledger and wallets and all people are still you know very, it's a very complicated affair anyway maintaining a, a crypto ledger or a crypto wallet all right now we're talking about tokenizing assets right <laughs> will it not share the he says normies okay that's a new word which i heard so tokenizing assets using blockchain won't scare normies how do we uh, convenience or uh, outer world space world okay what basically trying to say ki sure. will it be yeah. you know yeah i'm sure you got the got the hang of it yeah yeah Please. just a bit so uh, no i i think you know that is why i try to keep all these talks that i do very jargon free i try to start from the very beginning so that everybody is on the same page because it's wrong to assume that people know what we are talking about it's a tech in its infancy something new is happening every day uh now regarding you know okay, okay it make it makes it kind of more complicated i would uh, like to say that you know nothing is complicated as long as you understand the nitty gritties and it doesn't take very long if you speak to somebody who is already doing it they might be able to show you the ropes or point you towards uh, you know a resource uh, that would make things very clear for you so similarly on oro pocket as i said currently we are in talks to uh, with exchanges to list the token uh, but uh, you know right now it's a very simple straightforward platform you go there you uh, you know you make a purchase and you are allocated tokens as well which are erc20 tokens so it depends obviously on the i think the onus falls on these uh, the you know the tech layer and the solution providers to make it easy because somehow i think there is a you know hang up jab hum i think when i was very you know young and um, you know some uncle of mine used to do share trading okay with those very scary looking monitors and all of those he yeah, used to have stack of papers because then it was more analog it used to look very intimidating to me as well but then you know um, that is just i think the way 
these days now crypto traders are perceived right big big screens and lots of graphs and it's not that complicated it doesn't have to be that complex everybody has their own way of doing it and uh, you know just because a platform is uh, straightforward and it's easy to use doesn't mean that it doesn't have the same functionality so uh, you know we kind of as a team even with our last uh, crypto exchange we were very heavy on uh, the user interface that you know it should come across not as intimidating you don't want to scare your end user they should be able to use your product and feel free and you know not feel intimidated by it and that's important so uh, i think that kind of onus comes on the platforms to make their experience for the user easy and and you know what he said okay it kind of makes it more complex talk to somebody who doesn't talk uh, with you know all of these jargons and uh, you know these complex words just do, just talk to somebody else because you know it's not that complicated to begin with nothing is if you just like understand the fundamental yeah no uh, yeah, yeah just quickly to yeah chime in i mean like you know to take the to carry forward the example that you should brought up in terms of stock trading right um i i think there are platforms like say robin hood in the us or you know now you know like maybe zero da small case in india uh which have you know they have the potential to have those all those complexities but you know the uh you have the option to have a very simple interface as well and i think that's what you know the crypto industry is realizing as well um where you know no one cares about um any of the tech behind all you care about is you know uh, from a finance perspective getting exposure uh, uh, to particular assets or or growing your money um and so uh, i think increasingly you know uh, uh you know complexities and, and so uh, at least in our case because we focus on institutional clients um it becomes even more uh, you know difficult uh because retail you know uh, some enthusiasts will still read some medium blog posts or watch some youtube videos to figure things out uh, especially if they are interested but um you go tell um, you, you know uh, an institutional trader uh that you know you're going to have to pay gas and you're going to have to store your private key um and, and you know those kinds of things uh, and, and you may have to you know interact with your wallet with your metamask in your browser um yeah. you know those kinds of things uh, you know no institutional trader will uh, will be okay with and and so you know in terms of designing uh uh you know like what we have done at persistence as well so abstracting all those complexities of having to use any kind of tokens at the application layer of um having to you know uh, so then you know the problems of custody goes away problems of gas goes away um uh problems of you know uh, private key management goes away i mean these are real problems that exist and yeah, yeah. and once you abstract these problems only then can you get to a point where um you know you can have uh, what is you know as the cliche goes you can have mass adoption yeah, yeah absolutely you, I, I, you know what you said i think ultimately it's about solving a problem right so you have the end users problem needs to be solved so the onus kind of falls on the platforms to sort of make the experience more enjoyable and easy to look at and not intimidating indians uh, you know i'm not trying to be like i don't want to be generic but i think uh, what happens is that we tend to normalize complexity like we think that more complex more features or more functionality and that is not necessarily true like as he gave the example of robin hood right so it is you know an easy cool interface can also get that done so we need to sort of accept it and you know just normalize that normalize easy ui because uh, somehow in our head complexity is equal to functionality which is not the case yeah 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 absolutely yes i think it's more to do with currently it's more self learning and the peer learning or some mentor learning which is you know which will probably take more uh, you know more time to people to do it and probably one question which comes to my mind is you know when tushar mentioned about defi is you know you know uh, we probably end with this question there are several questions here we will see how we can reach out to them but we'll have a hard stop at 5 now last question is you know uh, is the adoption adoption of uh, you know of defi it's still uh, abysmal when it comes to the actual adoption yeah. and the number who are there now a uh, question is you know will tokenizing these real assets on the and bringing them on the blockchain and let's assume that there's a will it will it increase adoption i mean will tokenizing real estate assets you know increase adoption on the defi i would like to believe so yes but i think that it's an uphill battle right now currently people get confused with just crypto tokens right and obviously crypto tokens is part of that entire you know uh, ecosystem as well uh, but uh, somehow um, 
the narrative has become that it's crypto versus you know bitcoin versus defi which is uh, like a little absurd to me and uh, i think that it it is going to be an uphill battle but yes adoption should increase uh, as you know you go about uh, you know tokenizing real world assets that people already perhaps understand they might not understand crypto tokens but they understand the value that that particular asset brings right so if we are doing yeah. say gold and silver people already know what gold and silver bring to the table right so i i am hoping uh, and i think that uh, you know definitely 100% the adoption should increase okay tushar your thought on that yeah i mean that's what we're working towards uh, so you know absolutely but you know i think uh, you know like i mean i don't know if it's just maybe me because i'm so deep into the industry uh, mm-hmm. or deep into these products but you know and, and also you know like tarusha mentioned she spends time on twitter like i spend a decent amount of time on twitter as well and so you know that bubble kind of gets reinforced so i feel like everyone is super familiar with it um you know obviously you know the first time you transfer a big amount of money from like you know like say whatever your metamask to your binance to your you know third wallet or to your uh, you know ledger nano obviously it's scary right and and then over a period of time you get more and more comfortable yeah. um uh, and, and so it's it's a journey it shouldn't have to be and and i think over a period of time all these complexities mm-hmm. will be will be removed what we have to yeah. keep in mind is you know even within the people that at least i interact with it seems like everyone is now you know a user of defi so you're like okay maybe defi has like hundreds of thousands of users all across the world but you know like i mentioned earlier um the most popular defi applications still have you know uh, less than 5000 daily active users uh, you know so less than that less than that Like yeah, we revolve in that same circle, and we seem to think that there are more users. Uh, we live in that bubble, right. and you know somebody needs to come and prick it. <laughs> that okay, no, uh, there are not that many users, not that many people who are actually very familiar with this. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so the state of the DApps, uh, it, it actually says uh, you know there are less than five thousand, about two thousand five hundred odd daily users. Sure, yeah. Time. I mean, yeah. It, not surprised, you know, mm-hmm. and and so like something like synthetics, like you know, which gives exposure to synthetic assets. um you know synthetics.io if yeah. someone wants to check out you know it's a, it's a derivatives exchange platform uh that is getting increasingly popular um it has you know like i i use it all the time but i'm like shit like there's less than 1000 you know users yeah. on synthetics and so that's how niche it is right it's like you know um and, and so again i think it's a long journey um yeah. but you know if if we um you know if we take a step back mm-hmm. and we look at you know what the portfolio of a millennial would look like um you know uh, no one's going to buy maruti stocks or uh, you know mahindra and mahindra stocks and like you know my sister seven years younger like i cannot even imagine um uh, you know uh, thinking that you know she would want to get exposure to like the tata stock um and so you know millennials will hold a little bit of crypto maybe a little bit of you know uh, tokenized gold Uh, maybe few collectibles um you, you know uh maybe some tech stocks um and so that's where the future is so i think you know uh, both what um you know oro pocket is doing what we are doing is is building for the future uh you know to to me it's absolutely crazy that we live in 2020 and when you wire money from say singapore to india it still takes 2 to 3 business days yeah. for that transaction to settle right you transfer right. on friday the money will reach you on wednesday to me wh- right. while the bank is just updating its internal ledgers um so you know the financial system is you know um i wouldn't say broken but you know there's a lot of efficiencies that can be you know gained um the financial ecosystem financial services industry has you know failed to innovate for a very long time and so now what's happening is what defi so you have the real world banking and then you have you know defi defi tried to create a separate paradigm parallel paradigm itself but what yeah. oro pocket and persistence and and the applications in the persistence ecosystem what we're trying to do i think to summarize is match the two that you have the real world and then you have the decentralized finance world how can you match the two to get you know to answer your question to get greater adoption while removing all of the complexities you know that using true. public blockchains bring true true very true Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. i see i think it all starts and ends with you know how much of uh, awareness spread is there and how much education is there 
in the in yeah. the market and how much can we actually go about talking to each individual person say you know um, this is what is coming up and this is the future and this is where you should be going and yeah i think i think it all depends on how the millennials take it up and uh, thanks to tarusha and people like uh, tarusha and tushar who are doing this for us and the platform like these and many other people who are spreading awareness through such such channels as such and uh, we are we absolutely way beyond time we wanted to do our stuff at 5 o'clock uh, so uh, but we have missed out a lot of interesting questions maybe i can re- request the shar and tarusha to stay back in the social lounge if you can go and you know maybe the uh, anybody from the audience would like to speak to them directly you can sit in the social lounge and talk to them if you wanted but uh, we'll have to stop uh, our uh, you know our session yeah. here so and it was so it was can i make one one last point chantnu please yeah 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 Uh, so if i mean if you know i mean first of all you know you guys should realize that you've got literally at the bleeding edge of technology um and, and it's abs- and you know you're essentially the early adopters um but you know if any uh, any kind of budding entrepreneurs in the audience who wants to you know tokenize any other real world assets or if you have any ideas you know please do get in touch you know very active on linkedin twitter um you know uh, all the different kind of you know social media platforms um and, and would love to chat with you absolutely i think same oh, great here. great absolutely yeah. awesome awesome yeah so great i think this is a fantastic initiative uh, to all the people who would ask questions brilliant questions we will see how we can get these questions answered uh, you know by tushar and tarusha but of course you know there are a lot of things that we can be uh, you know you can sit behind and talk to people talk, talk to them on the social lounge uh, to both of you tushar tarusha thank you very much for uh, being on uh, today's uh, session thank, thank you uh, for organizing as always you. pleasure pleasure absolutely and to, and to all the others who are in the audience uh, there is a brilliant uh, session coming up next year, next week to next weekend which is basically going to be on a subject called ideation to io how can you take your idea from the ideation stage to the io stage and we have uh, sandeep nelwal from matic network who is going to come and talk to you about his journey and how they took matic from point a to point io so uh, be there and please visit our website inblocks.events inblocks.events and you can you know uh, you can you can see there uh, the entire details of from ideation to io we'll be putting our uh, we'll be updating our website again so thank you very much the, to the entire audience you can stay back in the social lounge and let's see if we can talk to each other and of course the speakers as well i'll request you to stay put here for some time i'll have to end my session here thank you very much uh, have a great weekend and uh, thanks for being with us let's see you again next time next week 